in my boots, you know. She walked up and she said, Tonight, you said, we believe we come from a rock. We do not believe that. I said, well, ma'am, calm down just for a minute. I said, do you believe in evolution? She said, yes, I do. I'm a professor here at the university. I said, well, would you please tell me then where we came from? She said, we came from a macro molecule. I said, uh, where did that come from? She said, from the oceans, from the prebiotic soup. I said, where did that come from? She said, well, it rained on the rocks for millions of years. <laughs> and you could see it was slowly dawning on her. I do believe I come from a rock, don't I? <laughs> yes, ma'am, you do. You ought to be proud of it. Hey, don't step on Grandpa, whatever you do. <laughs> Look, that's stupid, okay? There's no kind way to say it. There's a great book dealing with some of the flaws in the Miller experiment, if you want more on that for your kids to study out there on the table, get the book Icons of Evolution. Then they tell the kids that these plants and animals, not only did life evolve from non-living material, then this life had to learn to reproduce itself. Why would any organism want to reproduce more of its own kind when that's only going to increase competition for the food supply? Why didn't they instead evolve the ability to live forever and be happy? Huh? You ever think about that? I was in a debate one time, and the one, we had question and answer time at the end. The student stood up and he said to the uh, evolutionist, he said, uh, Sir, how did male and female evolve? The professor got up and he said, Well, that is a giant mother may I step in the evolution story. A mother may I step? <laughs> this is science. Wow. Ah, well. So according to them, you know, for the next few billion years or hundreds of millions of years, you know, life learned to, to produce something other than its own kind. Of course, today everything only produces its own kind, but they say long ago and far away, they were able to do something different. Textbooks will say, we started like a bacteria and slowly evolved to a human. I think that's stupid. But if you want to believe that, that's perfectly fine. Those trees of life that they put in the textbooks for your kids are a bunch of nonsense. And even evolutionists will admit that. Stephen Jay Gould, the Marxist professor at Harvard University, he says that evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks are not the evidence of fossils. It's only inference. We infer, we imply, we hope it happened this way. This textbook says, all the many forms of life on Earth today are descended from a common ancestor. What? You mean the birds and the bananas have a common ancestor? Isn't that what he says? Found in a population of primitive unicellular organisms. Well, in the first place, there's no such thing as a primitive unicellular organism, okay? One single cell is more complex than a space shuttle. There's no such thing as a primitive single-celled organism. We talk about that on video number four of our series. But he says, all the forms of life are descended from a common ancestor found in a population of primitive unicellular organisms. What were those first cells like? How do we know? What events led up to their formation? No traces of those events remain. Did you catch that? Hey kid, we know what happened, but there's no proof. Primitive, huh? This one says, the humans, mammals, birds, crocodiles, all had a common ancestor. Well, anything inside that circle is religious speculation. It is stupid. Reptiles produce reptiles, dogs produce dogs, people produce people, and there's never been an exception to that. Darwin said, though, if my theory be true, here's his book right here, you can look on page 211, he said, if my theory be true, numberless intermediate varieties must assuredly have existed. Boy, you're right about that, Charlie. I mean, to change from a rock to a dog would take a few changes. <laughs> David Ropp, who believes in evolution very strongly, says, in the years after Darwin, his advocates hoped to find predictable progressions. In general, these have not been found, yet the optimism has died hard, and some pure fantasy has crept into textbooks. Oh, you're kidding. Fantasy in our textbooks? <laughs> oh, yep. They tell the kids they have evidence of evolution from fossils. I don't think so. That is stupid, okay? If you find a fossil in the dirt, all you know is it died. You don't know that it had any kids, do you? And you sure don't know that it had different kids. I mean, think about it. You're in a court of law. You bring in a bone to the judge. Judge, I found this bone in the dirt. This is the ancestor of all the humans today. <laughs> they would laugh at you. You don't know that that's the ancestor of anybody, do you? And why on earth would you think a bone in the dirt can do something animals today cannot do? Animals today can only produce the same kind, right? Dogs produce dogs, folks. Luther Sunderland, 
asked all the major evolutionists, he said, where is the evidence for evolution? They all said, well, somebody else has it. We don't have it over here. So he wrote a letter to Colin Patterson. He's the director of the British Museum of Natural History. They've got the largest fossil collection in the world. He said, Mr. Patterson, I read your book on evolution. I noticed you didn't show us the missing links. Why didn't you show us the missing links? Patterson wrote back and said, I fully agree with your comments on the lack of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any, fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. I will lay it on the line. There is not one such fossil. There are no missing links, folks. No chain is missing. <laughs> Even Stephen Gould admitted, the absence of fossil evidence for intermediary stages is a persistent and nagging problem for evolution. We got the theory, we know it's true, now we just need the evidence. That's the way they think about it. <laughs> Richard Goldschmidt said, maybe the first bird hatched from a reptile egg. Oh, Richard, I'm sorry. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but that's stupid. <laughs> See, what's happened, these guys have looked for missing links in the, in the fossil record. They can't find any, and so they say, well, maybe evolution happened so fast it wasn't preserved. Maybe a reptile laid an egg and a bird hatched out. Well, who did that bird marry? <laughs> hmm? There's only about a zillion differences between a reptile and a bird. We'll get into that later sometime if we have time. But if they want to believe that, that's perfectly fine. Here's what happened. Charlie Darwin graduated from Bible college to be a preacher in the Anglican church in 1830. He couldn't get a job, so his dad pulled a few strings and got him a job on board HMS Beagle. He's going to sail around the world and collect bugs. And while he's sailing around, he stopped off at these islands right there called the Galapagos Islands. There on those islands, Charlie noticed there were 14 different varieties of finches. Charlie studied the birds very carefully and said, you know what, I think all these birds had a common ancestor. I bet you're right, Charlie. It was a bird. <laughs> and then Charlie said in his book on page 170, he said, it is a truly wonderful fact that all animals and all plants throughout all time and space should be related to each other. <laughs> now hold on a minute. You see 14 kinds of birds and you conclude that birds and bananas are related. That's stupid. You should conclude that those 14 kinds of birds had a common ancestor, but that's as far as it ever goes, folks, okay? I don't know of a kind way to say it, Charlie, but that's, that's stupid. Okay, we don't ever see a bird produce a non-bird. See, dogs produce dogs, and you might get quite a variety of dogs. Roses produce roses. That is called microevolution. Now, that is a fact, folks. It happens. It is observable. It is scientific. I don't think we ought to use that word, microevolution. We should just call it a variation. But they use it, so I, you know, just so you, I qualify that, it's, it's a lousy term. It gives what's called a free rider effect to the rest of the five religious ideas of evolution. You might get a big dog or a little dog, but you're always going to get a dog when you crossbreed your dogs. And I would go so far as to say, probably the dog, the wolf, and the coyote had a common ancestor. This Irish textbook shows different dogs, and it calls it divergent evolution. Oh, come on. Giving it a fancy name doesn't change a thing. It is still a dog. And a three-year-old can tell you. Who, anybody in here five years old? Who's five years old? Five years old. What's your name? Misty. Here we have a dog, a wolf, a coyote, and a banana. Which one is not like the others? Dog, wolf, coyote, and banana. Banana. All right, let's give Misty a hand. Very good. The other ones. Some of these college professors can't tell. Look, there's a variety of dogs, folks, and they probably had a common ancestor. It was a dog. Okay? It's, it's just a dog. See, variations happen within the dog kind. You get a big dog or a little dog, but there are limits to these variations. Haven't the farmers been trying to breed for bigger pigs for a long time? They try to get the biggest pig they can, don't they? Do you think they'll ever get a pig as big as Texas? <laughs> I bet there's a limit in there somewhere, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Roaches become resistant to pesticides after a while. Do you think they'll ever become resistant to a sledgehammer? I bet there's a limit, <laughs> yeah, okay. They still produce the same kind of plant or animal. That's not evolution. That's just a variation of the same kind, okay? And the information for that variety was already present in the gene pool. No new information is ever added. The dogs or the pigs don't learn to fly or become pink. 
Okay, there's no new information added, just scrambled information. And the gene pool of the new variety is now more limited than before. 